right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeremiah Vardaman with the University of Wyoming Extension. I wanted to welcome everybody to the Barnyards and Backyards live show. And today we changed it up a little bit. My co-host today is Abby Perry. We gave Jeff a day off. So welcome, Abby. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And also, you you probably won't see her, but you may hear from time to time. But our other our other uh, individual that puts on these shows is Jenny Thompson. She's behind the B&B logo, and she keeps everything running. Uh, she keeps us connected to Facebook and, and records and manages us all in the background. And so we really appreciate her. As always, Jenny, thanks for keeping us on task. And today, we're going to be talking about the yokes on you lane hen management. And so I think this is going to be a fantastic show. Um, and we have Emily Swinier with UW Extension. Um, she's a, one of our 4-H educators. And so we're really glad to have you today, Emily. Thanks for joining yeah. us. I'm excited to be here, guys. Um, yeah, I've had chickens basically my entire life. And it's something that I've enjoyed and know a little bit about. So I'm happy to share. Great. Great, we are, we are excited to hear about this. Um, before we get started, so if you're new to Zoom, you wanna just take your cursor of your mouse and roll it across the bottom of the screen and there'll be a chat box or a Q&A box and you can click those open and, and type your questions into the chat box or Q&A box. Abby and I are watching those and we will bring those questions forward to Emily as she's presenting. And if you are, uh, or if you're on Facebook Live, Put your um, questions in the comments section, and we will also bring that forward to Emily as we can. So with that, without further ado, well, I'm going to turn it over to you, Emily. And so why don't you share your screen? And where do we want to start with this? Well, let's get it started. Um, just got a little bit of a guide for us today. So general backyard ch chicken keeping. And this is... So my point of all of this was hoping that some of you probably got chicks last year, or maybe you're a seasoned keeper and you've been having birds for forever and you want a refresher, but this is pretty basic. These are, if you got birds last year and you're thinking, all right, now what? You have had you a year, right? I've been feeding you and you have been freeloading for a year. Let's get this party started. Um, so we're going to talk about the major changes with your birds and kind of their needs and how that has changed a year in. So we'll be talking about their nutritional needs, um, housing, egg laying, and more importantly for you is the gathering and the storing of eggs. So we will Perfect. just jump right in. And so for, for people like, uh, for some people that might not have gotten chicks last year, this is something to look forward to, but they have a year's commitment to get to this point in the management. Sometimes it is a year. Sometimes it's not. I know we had some surprise chicks hatch. We actually, the hen had gone missing and she showed up with babies last fall, which isn't an ideal time for new babies, um, but we found them a great home and they have just now started laying. So, so it depends on when that chick is born. It how does. they develop, how far along they are before they can mm -hmm. start laying. Yeah, and it also depends <clears throat> on the breed and variety as well. Great. All right. I think I, think I had some of those late season chicks <laughs> last year. And then they, I remember, I think it was uh, like December 10th was the first time I got an egg last winter. So that's not, oh, I know that that's not like the normal timing. Of no. Things, so I'm excited to hear. Um, all of the things you have for us. Yeah. So the biggest thing that's going to change um, as your birds are feathering out and as they're maturing, um, you know, they go through that really awkward teenage phase where they're losing all of their, their baby down and they're growing um, mature feathers that are quilled. Their, their needs are going to change. So they're going to need less of that protein. They're still going to need it, obviously, but, and they're going to need more calcium because their bodies are going to be providing shells for those eggs. So instead of it being more of that chick grower feed that you'll get, um, I recommend transitioning over into either an all flock or a layer blend. And those it's, you can supply um, scratch grains and things like that, but that is not a balanced 
diet for your birds. That's more of a um, gives them something to do sort of a thing. Think of it like um, like that's a dessert. That's a snack that should not be their entire meal. So make it, you know, some people choose to use the crumbles or pellets. It's really personal preference. Um, depending on the kinds of feeders that you use may work better depending on how you do that. Um, but again, just like any other situation, you want to provide free choice feed and make sure their water is clean and accessible all the time. So even with our crazy weather here in Wyoming, we may still get a freeze every now and then. It may be summer today, but it's like the spring of deception. It's okay. not, we're gonna get another foot of snow. Just, we know. <laughs> and another thing, um, if they're not free ranging and don't have access to any kind of grit in nature, you know, chickens don't have teeth, they'd have to have grit in their diet to be able to grind up their food and properly digest it. So, and so when it, you're talking about grit, Emily, what, you know, do I need to provide sand? Do I actually need to get actual rocks? What, no. what can I supplement as grit if it's not available naturally? And so how do I know if it's available naturally um, in your environment, if they're free ranging or whatever, you can buy it at stores. It's not as fine as sand and it's a little bit um, finer than just rocks and pebbles. Um, what you can also do is provide oyster shell which will, um, it's ground up and it's a great additional supplement of calcium and can also kind of serve as some grit in their um, cropping gizzard as well. Awesome. Yeah. But we wanna see a nutritional shift, right? From that younger bird. You do, you do. They're, they're less just- Less protein is what you're saying here. With our young birds, we want a lot of protein to get them right, growing they're healthy. Growing and the, the feather production um, and things. And what you may also notice is when they, um, when they molt, which typically happens in the fall, late summer and fall, I like to change my feed during that time as well and offer higher protein again. And so there are some feeds, um, I think Feather Fixer is one of them that is formulated for that to help them get through those hard molts. Um, different, th different things like um, black oil sunflower seeds are fantastic. They've got the oils in there. Um, they love to eat it. And at the same time, it really helps them get through those hard molts because you'll see the egg laying stop in the fall and late summers as well while their bodies are changing what they're using all the resources for. Right. Great. Yeah. And so you we just want to be looking at that <laughs> nutritional need. So now how do I, if I have a mixed flock of young birds and, and older birds, how do I, do I balance that nutrition there? How do I offer a, a different variety for the different needs? So that's a really great question, Jeremiah. Um, often you, like if you already had birds and you're integrating young birds into your flock. So you had some and you want to add some more for this year. That can be a little tricky because you've often heard the verbiage of them having a pecking order, which is, is true. They do. They have kind of a hierarchy and um, your older hens may really kind of bully the younger ones. And my recommendation is to, well, what we've used is either like a dog kennel with the wires blocked off where they can access and they can see each other. They can interact, but they can't harm each other. That allows for you to have separate feed and it allows for um, them to have contact and those kinds of things. Now, this is only after you quarantine. I do strongly recommend that you follow some quarantine procedures just for biosecurity. Um, it's really easy to bring in something nasty to your flock. And, and it can happen, you know, you bring the birds home, they look great, and then they're not. And it's too late. Everyone's exposed. And then it goes through the whole flock, right? It does. It does. And, you know, when I was a, in, I guess it was a few years ago when I, when we really got into birds, that was, that was a hard lesson for us to learn because someone gave us some and we're sure we didn't have a really great way to quarantine. And man, it was, we paid the price for that. And um, learned quickly things to keep on hand. Um, we, we learned some new best practices, if you could say. Sure. Um, we got yeah. a question off of Facebook for you from uh, okay. Linda K. Can you use boiled water from eggshells to supply extra calcium? I 
have heard that. I've never done that myself. One thing I have done is um, any of your eggshells that you've from your birds that you've used, you can crush those back up and your birds will love to eat them. So recycle the eggshells. Recycle the eggshells. Yeah. Cooking. Do I've you never, need to wash those before you put them back out there or? Nope. I, one thing I did do is I would smash them up so it didn't look like an egg because you don't want them to get into the habit of eating any orb shaped items or even half because egg eating is a really hard habit to break. Perfect. Yeah. So we but, have another question off of Facebook oh, sure. from Melinda. Uh, if mine are not free range birds, what can I plant in their yard to help with nutritional needs? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, any kind of safe forage. Um, they, one thing that they really do like, even if you're not necessarily planting, which I almost discourage a little bit because it's, they're not going to let it get big enough to have for it to be worth it. Does, it, does that make sense? As soon as something starts to sprout or new leaves, it will not last long. Um, one thing that is really great if you have access to um, alfalfa hay, that is really, really excellent source of added nutrition. Um, you'll notice your yolk color will, will become a very, very vibrant orange. Um, so in the summer times, I would put a flake of alfalfa in there and they'd peck around in it. And that was seemed to be a little bit easier. Another thing that I did is I would sprout, um, I would actually order, they were mung beans mm -hmm. and I would sprout them inside. So, and then I would give them the sprouts. And I did that particularly in the winter time just to give them something green to eat. So when you say that it won't last, is that because they are uh, like curious and will destroy it that way or just yeah. like <laughs> eat it, the curiosity? Both. Cause I've heard a few of like, <laughs> distracting them while you plant things so that they don't see you planting it and it being helpful or if that's just like nope it's destined to be destroyed they will find it and they will eat okay. it don't plant anything that they can get into um I mean it's the same I you know I love to have the pretty flowers on the front porch and things like that and if your bird's free range those are fair game they're gonna be gone <laughs> so, so we just we just have a clarification question for you Emily that yeah. was among beans mung beans m-u-n-g um and they're sold dried but you can rehydrate them and sprout them and so what i did is i would just do mason jars and add a little water every day and rinse them and they would sprout inside and i would start off with just like an inch of beans on the bottom and by the end of a week i would have a full mason jar of sprouts ready to feed there you go great yeah very nutritious yeah. um we have one more of... question off of Facebook for you sure. and it may jump, jump us ahead. So if we need to hold oh. off on the question to answer okay. it, get ahead, we can. But the question is, when you have a flock, how can you tell who is laying and who is freeloading? Hmm. Also, how long do you keep a bird before putting them in the pot? Ah, okay. So um, the first one is how do you know who's laying and who's not? Um, if you look at this picture, I know it's not the best, but the one on the left here, that is a younger pullet. You can tell she's losing her baby feathers. Her comb is very pale. Um, when they are mature and are actively laying, their combs get much redder, like the picture to the right. Um, another way you can check is by looking at their vent um, and just kind of looking at how wide that is. If it is about two fingers wide, you're actively, you have an active layer. If it's smaller and more narrow, she's probably not laying at that time. And, and they do go in cycles and their bodies take natural breaks. Um, like I mentioned with molting um, and things like that, it, you kind of got to let their bodies take a little bit of a break. Um, and I'm going to hold off on the stew pot for a little bit. Sounds good. All right. That sounds good. When Emily, we just I, had a oh. follow-up comment in Facebook. Uh, Linda K said, "Melinda, I sprout wheat berries uh, to, and just like the mung bean, they sprout mm -hmm. them and then they feed to the chickens." Yep. So appreciate barley that. Barley is another one that grows really well, easy to sprout, great for them to eat. Yeah. 
Emily, as a follow up is like who's laying and who's not. Um, when I, when my birds first started laying, it seemed like I went out and checked on them a lot because it's, it gets very exciting when they start laying yeah. eggs and it seems like they don't all lay. Like I was under the impression that they would all lay first thing in the morning, mm -hmm. but I learned quickly that I had like some lunchtime layers that I would check on, you know, on my lunch hour, when I came home from work and like checking on them frequently, I would kind of catch them in the laying box and just like get to know them and who was laying at what times just by like frequently checking in. Yep. I don't know if you have any other, as far as when, when they lay, it's not all in the morning or just, you know, some, some timing stuff. Yeah. It, that, you know, it, that's truly their own body's internal clock of when they're going to lay. And depending on the variety of your bird, they're not going to lay every day. And so that may be um, something to take into consideration when you're looking at, is it, are we, are we ending our time as production? And then you have to reevaluate, are you a pet or are you livestock kind of a thing? And those are personal preferences as well. Um, but knowing when they lay, you're right, Abby, is a big thing because it's going to be all throughout the day. And that's why we recommend if possible to try and gather eggs twice a day because um, that'll eliminate some other things that we're going to talk about later on. Great. Well, let's, let's move on, Emily. I think we got some of the questions handled awesome. and everything, so we'll just see where it goes. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is supplemental lighting. Now, I know that we just are coming out of winter, but something that, that is a question that's brought up a lot is, do I su supply lighting in the winter time? And there's some pros and cons to this, and I'm just gonna give you guys the straight facts. Um, adding supplemental lighting is a, is a great way to extend your hen's laying season, um, especially in the winter. Here we have lim much shorter days, so you can set your lights to an automatic timer. They'll come on by themselves, and it's a way to kind of trick your birds into thinking that it's a time because they most of them are seasonal layers, anyways, and we've just tricked them into laying longer. Um, so egg laying is is a photo period response. Then. It is. It is. So it is. You'll notice in the springtime, days get longer. Um, the temperatures come up, they're going to start laying more prolific, right? prolifically. Um, but you may not choose to do this. I know personally we did not. Just because the winters are really harsh here, we chose to allow them to kind of have that recovery winter. You would still get some eggs here or there, but by the time you would get them in the evenings, a lot of times they'd be frozen and split. Um, so it was just a good way for your birds to have some recovery and let them use their resources for maintaining and, and surviving them winters. So if I did choose to do some lighting, how, how long do I need to set that lighting period for, um, you know, how many hours does that need to be set? Is it better in the morning, in the evening? So what we would, what the hour kind of the magic number is about 14 hours. And um, what you can do, like I said, is set an automatic timer to come on about 7 a.m. And it'll, and to extend it more in the evenings because it does get darker sooner. And that just tricks them into thinking that it's still go time on the eggs. Um, one thing to consider though is, you know, just like any female, your chickens are born with all of the eggs that they are ever going to lay. They may, they're not going to all have shells on them, but if you ever do like a necropsy or you've ever butchered a chicken, you'll notice if it's a hen, you will have all of those eggs, all of the little yolks are there. And so by pushing their bodies to lay more, you're going to get more eggs per year, but you're going to speed up that process of her going through her, her body's resources. So you're um, going to shorten so, her time of being correct. able to lay in, in number right. of years. Okay. Yeah. So you may have only three or four good years instead of six or seven, or maybe just two good years. It depends on, um, again, it depends on the variety. And some, some varieties of birds are just not prolific layers. They may lay two or three eggs a week and call it good. So with that light, do I need to look for a certain type of a light bulb or lighting source or a certain wavelength of light that they need? Not really. Um, we, when I first started doing this and when we did 
do supplemental lighting. Um, we used like Christmas lights in there and it just kind of gave some ambient lighting. You could do rope lights. Um, other things that I've seen that work great are just having a little solar panel, stick it on the roof and run it in and just have some regular light bulbs. Um, one thing to really consider though, if you are adding additional lighting is safety. Chicken coops tend to be get a little dusty and we just wanna make sure that any kind of fire hazard or risk is, is taken is mitigated, seriously. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Anything else on supplemental lighting? I think we. No, nope, it's a personal choice that you can do. Um, some people just like it uh, because they want to continue to get their eggs through the winter. Um, but it's definitely an option for you. Um, the next thing is supplying heat. Again, here in Wyoming, we know that the weather is wacko. And um, I have to tell you this story. So it was a few years ago. It was probably our first winter of me as an adult in Wyoming with my own birds. Because um, like I said, we, we've had chickens, you know, as a child, but not me as a grown up with my own chickens, with my own coop. Um, so I go outside and it's evening and it's dark and I'm walking out I'm like, man, somebody is having a barbecue in the neighborhood and did not invite me. Um, and I come around the corner and the barbecue is my chicken coop because I was using a heat lamp similar to this metal one. Instead of it having a carabiner, it had, um, it was almost like a clamp yep. on the end. And yep, they're sold with those. They are. And it fell into the shavings. So the birds were flying up to roost and knocked it down. And the floor of my coop was on fire. Um, so the, the shavings and, and feathers and things. And so that's what I was smelling. It was not a barbecue. And thankfully, not a good thing no to birds. Find. Yeah. <laughs> thankfully, it was small and we were able to stomp it out really quick, but it could have been awful. It could have been, it could have been really bad. So one thing that after that, I was like, yeah, we're never doing that again because they they scare me because it is so dusty and you have birds that are flying up to roost and the, the risk just is not there for me. It's just, but I have found and some those really lamps are hard, right? Because you need to keep them low enough to the ground to where the birds can get under them and feel the effect of the heat. You do. But you don't want them too close to where they're singeing feathers and, and catching something on fire. And that's what you don't want them to land on it and burn their feet. So right. there's, there's a lot, but I found some really great, um, safer choices that we use now and I'm going to share. Um, so there are other models, which this one really surprised me because it's plastic and you would think that metal would be, that the plastic would melt because truly if this metal version touched something plastic, yeah. it would melt it. But for, well, I don't know what kind of magical unicorn plastic they're using but these do not get, they're warm to the touch, but they're not gonna catch anything on fire. And that's a great there. option, yeah. And um, this was what we ended up going to in our coops. And um, they're a radiant heat panel and the little legs come off and it has holes in the back where you can hang it on the wall too. Mm -hmm. And it's thermostatic. So it'll only come on when it's below freezing and it'll raise it, you know, maybe 10 or 20 degrees and then it'll turn itself off. Um, I have that option in my coop too. I'm really yeah. like it. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, you don't have to worry so much about the dust. They're still, they're warm to the touch, but they're not, you know, you can tell when the birds are cold because they'll just go in and stand in front of it. And it's easy to keep clean. That was definite. That's, that's a favorite of mine. Um, and they do sell those at a lot of, you know, you can get it at tractor supply or Shipton's or whatever you have in your area. Um, but those are my recommendations. I just, I know that these are kind of old school and, and what a lot of people are used to having. I was like with the red bulbs um, and things like that, but they scare me so bad. <laughs> After that, I just, um, I just can't. So we, is it, if I understood this correctly, do we have to apply supplemental heat that's, you that's don't. kind of a must no you don't um your birds are actually 
there are certain varieties that are gonna withstand Wyoming winters better than others, um, but you do not have to provide supplemental heat. In fact, if you let their bodies slowly acclimate, they're gonna do just fine. Things to pay attention to are um, comb size. So breeds like your Wyandots and things that have a, a more compact, like, a, your, like your rose combs and pea combs and things, those are gonna do better than your big single combs because they're gonna get frostbitten. Um, another thing is feathered legs are gonna fare a little bit better than your bare legged breeds. Um, I also have a Polish hen and she, of course, tends to like a little bit of extra heat versus the right. other breeds. Mm -hmm. And there, there are ones that just have the larger body capacities and, you know, they're just, they're built for it. Like your big coachins, they're ready. Mm -hmm. um, another thing to think about that I didn't include in this, but I want to interject really quick is your um, roosting bars at night. The size of the roosting bars is really important. And I'm kind of mad at myself that I didn't include this because they need to be flat, not round. They need to be flat and they need, you know, natural branches are fine and wonderful, but by them being flat, your birds are able to kind of nestle down over their feet at night and that will protect those toe tips from frostbite. So they need to be wide enough for them to be able to hold on and still be able to nestle down on top of them. Again, that's that was a, something I learned the hard way. But I'm like, yeah, I was going to say that is like toes? not counterintuitive. You would think they need something to grab on, do something round. You would think, <laughs> but, but really having it where they can nestle down on those is going to protect those toes. And you know, the other thing is some people will feed like cracked corn and things in the evenings as like a little, mid, little late mm -hmm. night snack, and that will kind of keep the furnace going during the night. Um, having that feed available is what's going to keep their, their core temperatures up. I've heard of people making like almost like a porridge with their crumbs and boiled water and giving that to them in the morning. Do you, have you ever tried that or do you have tips of no, you shouldn't do that? I've heard of that and I've, okay. I tried it. Um, okay. I just, I didn't have great success with it. One thing okay. that we really did like doing was, um, the fermented feed. Okay. Um, and basically you just take your regular chicken feed and you soak it and it goes okay. farther and it's a little okay. bit easier for them to digest, but I never made any kind of porridge for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. We have one uh, comment off of Facebook from Mary. I use a timer to both turn on my light and the water heater to keep the water from freezing in the winter. I use the light to keep the girls moving around so they are warmer without needing heat. When they, they are moving, they are eating layer feed, which helps them keep warm. So it's kind of a combination of things, right? Keeping them yeah. full so they have plenty of nutrients to burn yep. and calories to burn as it gets colder, um, more activity, and then supplementing some heat. Or in this case, like water freezes, right? But we got to give those birds some water. Yeah, and there are some great, um, there are some really great ways to keep your water thawed um, in the winters. Um, using those blue heated dog water bowls. Yep. Those are awesome. Um, also, they make some, um, they make a variety of different ones. One that we made ourselves was we just got a five gallon bucket and drilled some holes around the edges and did the horizontal drinking nipples, not the ones that hang down horizontal that stick out. And then we just fed um, a little de-icing ring down through a hole in the lid and have that sitting on a cinder block and that worked great and if you have a larger flock they can't get it the water dirty it's going to stay thawed and that was a great way to do it as well awesome yeah what's next nest boxes because if you are getting into laying eggs they're going to need a place to do it so you need you can have them all the same size but some of your birds you know if you need if you have large birds you're going to need bigger nest boxes right and, you know, you see these things at the stores of, you know, selling nest boxes and stuff, but really, as long as it has the, some minimum requirements, anything can be a nest box. Um, so having a lip on the front edge to keep any rollout, that's going to be a big one. Um, straw or wood shavings. I prefer doing um, 
wood shavings because straw can house some parasites and things. Um, you can get mites and things like to hide in the straw, although the straw does hold some heat in better. So it's kind of a little bit of a trade off there. Um, you will find that you'll have a nest box that is the favorite nest box. You may mm -hmm. have 20 hens and 10 nest boxes, which is probably too many, but they're all gonna wanna lay in like the same two nest boxes and they'll fight over it. And they'll all, there'll be mm -hmm. like a line of them <laughs> waiting to use that nest box. Um, but really you don't, you don't need a, a nest box for every bird. You know, one for every maybe four or five, because like I said, they're going to they're going to have their favorites. And then you may even have some that choose not to lay in a nest box like yours, Abby. Yeah, it's going to make it an Easter egg hunt every day. Yeah, all the time. Right. Oh. Behind, in the corner, behind the feed bunk. And we, yeah, we find them under the grill when we take off the grill cover. It's like, oh, look, there's <laughs> eggs God. down here. Yeah, they and they um they pick all sorts of fun locations. They do, and that makes it hard also because you want to make sure that you're gathering very frequently and that they're fresh. And if you mm -hmm. find it, I mean, that's what happened like in the fall where I thought we had a hen that was missing and she showed up with babies. She had a secret stash of eggs somewhere that she decided she wanted to hatch. Mm -hmm. And we did not know this. <laughs> so she was hiding them in the barn. So for those nest box, how often should you be changing out the sawdust or the wood shade? You know, that's oh. a really great question. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But keeping them Perfect. clean is, is really important, not only for your hens to want to use them, but also for your egg cleanliness as well. Um, another thing with nest boxes that I didn't include on here is some of your hens may really, they may be private girls. They may not, they're, they're kind of vulnerable when they're laying because it puts their body in a little bit of a stressful, they're, they're prone to predation and things like that. And um, they just may be like a little privacy. So I've seen some people make curtains or turn the nest boxes to the side. So the opening is not facing the door so that they have a little privacy. Some of them are just funny and they're gonna lay under the steps no matter what you do. Right. <laughs> so we have a question yeah. uh, from Facebook. Linda Kay asks, is it okay to let the girls dig through the horse manure? Oh yeah. I mean, as gross as it sounds, they're gonna, they're, that's what they're designed to do. Um, they're gonna break apart that manure. They're gonna look for bugs that are in there and things like that, or seeds that were not fully digested. It kind of grosses us out, but for them, it's that's choice. pretty good. Yeah. And I, I don't, it seems like a dirty, dirty habit, but I, it, how do you stop them? Right? You don't, I'm not sure you, you can don't. really stop them unless you can cage them or fence them to where they have no access to that. That would be hard, but yeah, right. at least it's not harmful to them. It's not harmful for them. And in fact, it's actually useful for us because it can help spread apart that manure and kind of break it down. It's something that it's actually very helpful because they, they spread it out and break it down into a, a more usable substrate instead of just this rock hard thing. Awesome. Yeah. What's after nest boxes then? Well, more nest boxes. <laughs> oh, fun ideas. <laughs> so, so literally anything can be a nest box. Right. And so, you know, like these down here in the bottom right, this is what they're going to try to sell you at your farm store. And that's fine. They're great. And they're functional and they're pretty, but they don't have to be. You know, as long, like I said, as long as it meets those requirements, nest boxes can be anything um, from like, this is what we used where we liked the cat litter boxes. You can clean them out. They have a lip on them already and they have a handle. I mean, and you're recycling. So those were, I was a fan of those. Um, and the milk crates are great. Um, same, similar with these, with the five gallon buckets, but those are something you have to buy. Whereas these were something you just got as a byproduct of buying something else. Um, larger birds, or um, I know with our guineas or turkeys, these, these big totes that you can cut a hole in, those worked really well um, for your larger birds, especially if you have some that really just like to lay on the ground. Because some are going to want to be ground layers. They just are. It's just there. Um, so if you had a ground layer, you just need to get a nesting box that's on the ground. Don't, don't elevate much. it. In that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, 
And what I recommend is kind of having a variety of spots at first to kind of see what they like. Because if they're going to have, if all of them are wanting to use those ground nest boxes, then maybe that's just what you need to have. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And I've even, I didn't include a picture, but I've seen some people where they even used like old dressers and took out like every other drawer. It's a huh. little goofy, but it works fine. And so I think the biggest thing here is being creative and recycling when you can to reduce your costs because the birds don't care. There you go. Awesome. Uh, Emily, what about encouraging them or discouraging them from sleeping in their nest boxes or is oh, that a yeah. problem? That can I just... definitely be a problem. And that is, this is a good place to talk about that. So that is going to lead to really dirty nest boxes because they're going to sit in there and they're going to poop in it all night and it's gross. Mm -hmm. And then when they do lay eggs in it the next day, they're going to be gross. Mm -hmm. So there, it just is a bad, bad habit to start. Um, I know we, it kind of started with ours when we had some silkies and they didn't like to get up on those higher roosts. They weren't able to. And for some reason I, I put a lower roost, but they just preferred those nesting boxes. And it just, it's just a mess. So it's hard to discourage truthfully because um, they're either, they're gonna wanna go where they feel safe and secure, um, but just having, having enough roost to space okay. is, is an important piece as well and having it higher. And could that be an indication that they don't like their, I'm thinking about trying the nesting box on the ground and is sleeping in their next nesting box. Can that be an indication that they don't like to lay in it or not necessarily their two Not really. Topics? Okay. It's just a comfortable spot for them. Okay. Yeah. But it is going to make that cleanliness factor yeah. a little harder for you. Right. Um, so gathering eggs. So this is the next thing. So you've got your nest boxes, you've got your birds, they're starting to lay finally. And the gathering eggs. So Abby, you mentioned some of yours would lay in the mornings and some would lay mm -hmm. around lunchtime and then you'd go out in the evening. Oh, there's one more. Right. Um, kind of pick up on their schedules. And I know a lot of us are working and we're not home to check. So you can check them first thing in the morning and then at night when you go lock up the coop. And that's as good as it's going to get. Um, but with the gathering itself, um, there's a lot of, you know, the, the picture I have here is the cutesy little basket with the line, the fabric liner and things like that. And that's great. Um, but one thing I want folks to remember is the functionality first. Um, I have, my mom made the cutest egg gathering apron and it's where it has all the little pockets and they're pleated. You can put a little egg in each little pocket and they're so cute. And, but you have to be really careful with it because when you go, if you're anything like me, you'll go out and you'll bend over to get the eggs and then they'll either fall out or you'll crush them with your own self. Um, and so they're really cute. And they're, they probably, probably, but they're not very on. functional. It doesn't, not necessarily functional. as functional, although they're, they're, I was thinking putting a, an individual egg in each pocket that just doesn't seem very efficient to me. And then no, you got to put them they, all in there. And if they survive the trip and then you get inside, then you got to take them all individually out. <laughs> they're that really, like a lot you of know, I I'm still lazy, love Emily. mine, but <laughs> it's, I just have to be really careful when I use it, but I got to tell you my favorite thing to gather eggs in. Well, I have two. One is a Folgers red coffee mm. can. That's basically how we measure everything in my life is a red scoop. <laughs> or my, my favorite favorite is an ice cream bucket um, because I feel better about eating the whole bucket of ice cream and then <laughs> recycling. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, well, I need this new bucket and it has a handle and a lid. But those are really great also. And then if they get funky, you can throw them in the dishwasher or, you know, you're, you're giving it a new purpose. And so if, if, you know, if you need to pitch it, that's okay. You at least didn't just throw it away as soon as you were done with it. Um, so we gathering often. 
we got a thumbs up from Facebook from Mary on the apron comment. She she's in total support of that comment. They're cute, <laughs> wonderful, but not functional. Well, so cute. Thank you, Mary. I, I, I tell you, that one my mama made. It hangs in my kitchen and I use it every now and then, but ugh, I've broken so many eggs in that thing. Cause I just like plop myself down to get in the nest box and then. Yeah. yeah, I've also gone to town with eggs in my pockets that I've yeah. stuck in my mm -hmm. coat pocket and then God, I'm not alone in that. Yep. <laughs> or I'll, um, I'll put it in the, I'll get the egg out of my pocket when I get in the car and I'll put it in the cup holder and then there'll just be an egg in my cup holder. Yeah, it's totally normal, right? Right. Totally <laughs> normal. But you, you said gathering often. So you said if possible, gather twice a day. Mm -hmm. Um, it is three or four times a day too much. You can if you're home. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing is if you're home. So many of us are working and we're just, you know, this is, we're not able to babysit the coop all day. Um, but if you look at the eggs in this picture, this is pretty accurate. Um, but they're, they're dirty. Um, and so we're going to talk about whether to wash or whether not to wash eggs next. Um, but if you keep your coop really clean and you keep your nest boxes clean, meaning they're not roosting in them, they're not sleeping in it, you keep fresh straw, fresh shavings in there, unless your, your hen has something on her foot and she gets in there, your eggs are going to be very clean. Um, you're going to have minimal soiling on the egg. Um, so let's kind of talk about washing first. So there's kind of two schools of thoughts with your eggs. If you're going to wash them, you have to use hot water, not warm, hot water. And the thing with washing your eggs is it removes all of that natural bloom, which is basically a, as the hen is laying the egg, it is an antibacterial layer that she, her body puts on the outside of that egg and it prevents any bacteria from getting inside, which is super important because it, her mind her purpose of laying that egg is for it to become a chick and you don't want any bacteria getting in there so it's naturally sealed off but it's porous so it has those pores and those in the shell so if you are going to wash your eggs don't let them sit in the water because it almost creates a vacuum almost oh. with the pores mm -hmm. and so once you wash them you in the hot water and you're not letting them sit in the water you need to refrigerate them right away because you've removed that natural antibacterial coating. And so they will need to be refrigerated, but they look really great. They're pretty. If they have any soiling or, or anything on the outside, they present well for resale. And um, if you are going to sell them like at a co-op or things like that, you are going to be required to wash them. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so your, a question, oh, and maybe we're jumping ahead on this, but I, I've always heard and, and seen it done that people get farm fresh eggs, right? And, and the old adage is you need to float the eggs, right? You fill up the sink and you put your eggs in there to see which ones are good or not. And then they sit in water. And so wh where does that fit in? You just said, okay. don't let it. So they're not in. soaking in it for a long period of time. So if you are going to float your eggs, that's fine. But that's more like if you go in the barn and you find this hidden clutch of eggs of like 10 eggs. It's not for lay, if you let, if you're gathering your eggs every day from your chicken coop or wherever they lay, you don't need to float test your eggs. But if you find a nest and you're not sure of the age. <laughs> that's for me. That's for Abby. <laughs> <laughs> Which I mean, that's honestly. for the girls that hide them in the back. You don't know about, right? right? Yeah. yeah. And so the reason that works is inside the egg, there's an air cell pocket pocket of air and um as the egg gets older or more stale that air pocket size will increase meaning it will float yeah um so it's just a way to test the age of that egg it's not going to tell you if it's rotten or anything but if they're starting to tip up on their ends or they're floating and not sinking at all i wouldn't eat them so um, they're just an aged egg probably didn't get to them soon enough better right. off taking and throwing discarding those them eggs, and getting rid of them however you do yep and then keeping the ones that are on the bottom of the sink Correct. but we're talking like they're in the water for 
five minutes, 10 minutes, if, right? If that truly yeah. you can tell immediately by putting it in a, in a bowl, it's either going to sink or it's going to float and you can get it out. You don't have okay. to let it sit there and balance itself out. It is a quick response. So it's not going to need to sit in there longer than 30 seconds if you don't want it to. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And so when you say sitting in the water, like over a few minutes, you know, yeah. two, three Just minutes, don't we let don't it want sit longer a, than that. I wouldn't. Don't let it sit in there for, you know, 10 minutes or something to soak or soften up any of the soiling on the outside. Like if you got, if there was chicken poop on the outside of your egg and if it's not coming off, you can use a gentle brush or um, I've even um, used sandpaper in the past or vinegar. If you are washing it and you can't get it off using some vinegar, vinegar to kind of dissolve that piece. Um, but I don't recommend sit, letting them sit and soak. Just because, soak, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a um, question off of Facebook oh, from yeah. Linda K. What are your thoughts on deep litter? Oh, I love the deep litter method. <laughs> so, Explain that. Explain okay. that. Um, deep litter method is when you do not, basically you don't clean out the shavings in your coop every weekend. You let it kind of naturally layer up. What you can do is you can add fresh straw or shavings on top of the droppings that are in there and kind of give it a quick stir. And it's gonna kind of create a natural microbiome. You're gonna have um, the good bacteria that are breaking down that waste. And another great thing is in the winters, that creates its own heat source. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to clean it out. I mean, <laughs> in the winters, because it can freeze solid. Now in the summers, I recommend, even if you are doing a deep litter method, pull everything out, put it in the compost for a year, and let that nitrogen rich kind of balance itself back out. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a fan of the deep litter method for sure. Awesome. Yeah. We have another question, but I think you're going to be answering this later on. So we can hold okay. off. But the question is from Melinda on Facebook. Sometimes I gather my eggs and there is an occasionally cracked one, but not leaking. Do you wash it, use it right away, throw it out? Ah, so that's a great question. If it is cracked, um, sometimes they can, either if they're hitting the side of your nest box or if the hen knocks it into another egg, they can crack. Um, but if it's not leaking and the membrane itself is not broken and the membrane is that kind of fleshy interior of the egg, if that is not ruptured, I would just eat that egg first and I would not wash it. Perfect. So there just because it's, it doesn't have, a, you know, that the the bloom and everything is already compromised by having that crack by introducing water to it you're just asking for you're asking for trouble perfect Eat it first. Okay. so, so let's, talk about, not let's washing. talk about that yeah let's talk about not washing those eggs um as i've mentioned several times washing them removes that bloom and does allow bacteria to enter but the positive with having some unwashed eggs is they can be stored on the counter the United States is really a, a unique place because we are one of the few places in the world that uh, has, we, we think that you have to refrigerate your eggs. In most countries, they don't. They sit on the counter um, and they can sit out for two to three weeks unwashed because they have that natural antibacterial layer. Or if they're refrigerated, they can go three to four months. They last a lot longer if they're unwashed. Um, but like I said, keeping those nest boxes clean and gathering often, that's, what, that's what's going to keep them looking like this basket here. Great. So we have a question from Laura. What yeah. if you float an egg you know is two weeks old and been unrefrigerated? Throw it out? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't eat it. Awesome. Give it to your dog. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> or scramble it up and feed it back to your chickens, to be honest. My girls loved that. If I had eggs that were a little stale and they didn't pass my inspection, um, or the shells were so gross that I just, I couldn't sell it and I didn't want to soak it. I wouldn't want to consume it myself. I would scramble that egg up and I would even save the shell and put that in there and feed it to them for breakfast. The birds, not myself. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great source of protein and it just goes right back into their system. So. No harm, What's no next? Problem. So we've talked about washed eggs, unwashed ah. eggs. 
So the next part is what to expect. Expect. <laughs> what to expect when you get or when you're cracking open these eggs. So sometimes you're going to get some peculiar things and do not panic. So of course, these are not normal, normal, but they're not dangerous. They're not harmful. You may get some extra calcium deposits on the outside of your eggshells. That just means that your girls have some extra calcium. And so they may almost look like a little pearly shaped, a little round. Some of them will just be on the ends. It's not a big deal. Um, unique and uneven color. This just means they got rushed in the laying process. And, it, it, and so truly, egg sh eggs are a lot like people. We have all kinds of colors and patterns, but the insides are basically the same, right? And so try not to focus too much on what the exterior of the egg looks like as far as color. We had one that I would joke around that she ran out of toner because it would start blue. She was a um, Easter egger and it would kind of fade to white. Like she just never made them all the way blue. <laughs> so they were very pretty. And another thing you may see is wrinkled or, or creased shells. This one in particular is extra wrinkly, but sometimes you can get that if your hen has, um, if she's kind of startled or scared during the laying process or if she's older, you may have some wrinkling. Um, another thing can be, I kind of call it a body checked where it cracked and her body repaired it or um, like there was something happened while she was laying and it kind of messed up that whole process. Um, they're not gonna hurt you to eat them. They just may look a little funny. And that's okay. Um, other so it's more that, about, like you said, what's on the inside that matters. Right. That's what we need to look at to see if an egg is good or not good. Correct. Um, these are the interior things that you may see. So, um, and this can even happen with store-bought eggs, but it's more common when you have um, fresh backyard eggs. So meat spots, blood spots, those are just little hiccups in her reproductive system. So if she has a, a blood vessel that ruptures in there because laying eggs can be a little bit traumatic. So if that happens, um, you may have a blood vessel or a meat spot. This is not, this is not a baby chick. This is, this is a normal thing. It's nothing to freak out about. Um, and so if it bothers you, you can remove it before cooking and consuming it, but it's not something that's harmful to you. And it doesn't mean your hen is sick either. Um, Another thing you may see is this is the um, the caleza, which is that white stringy stuff that comes off of the yolk, and that is actually inside the egg. It helps suspend that yolk in the middle, so it's kind of a fibrous tissue there. Um, the older your eggs are, meaning if they're store bought, probably they've been a little older, you're not going to be able to see them as much. Um, sometimes people can see them and freak out and think that it's that their that their chicken has worms or something and it's visible in the eggs because they can look like that sometimes but they're not this is a normal part of a healthy chicken egg it's not going to hurt you and they just sit on the inside of the shell and hold the yolk up and stabilize mm -hmm. the yolk so it's not Correct. banging against the edge of uh, the shell so yep perfect so they're totally normal and it'll just look like white little stringy stuff um but nothing to be alarmed about. It's, it's not a worm, your chicken's not sick and it's not gonna hurt you to eat it. So, so these are things that are- not normal? No, no, not normal. Um, this is the, the, the ever feared lash egg. So it, they'll often lay it, but it is an infection. It is, this is not an egg. This is layers of infection and grossness that they can lay. And this unfortunately means that your, your hen is sick. So do not eat this, do not consume this. Um, I should have included a picture of it cut because you can see the layers and that it's kind of gross. But um, then your bird needs treatment though. Your you bird, need to be looking in. And treatment. it's not something that's very easily treated. Um, sometimes it'll clear up on its own. Um, and it's just something that happens sometimes, unfortunately. Um, another thing that you may get is an egg without a shell. The first time I got one of these, it totally freaked me out because I went in to grab it and I was like, wow, ah, what is this? Because it just feels like a jelly blob. So you have the membrane on there, which is why it's able to maintain that egg-like shape, but it doesn't have the shell. Um, and so sometimes that can happen, just a hiccup in their reproductive tract, the egg-laying process. Sometimes it means that they are deficient in calcium. 
Um, but I wouldn't consume it because it doesn't have that bloom. It doesn't have that shell to protect it. So it's just a free for all for bacteria. I would not eat those. No, would you feed it to your chicken? Sure. Okay. Yeah, they can eat it. <laughs> yep. Give it back to him. Now these are gross. I'm sorry. And it's early in the morning. Sorry guys. <sighs> Um, but if you crack it and you see any kind of discoloration or mold on the inside, um, especially on that membrane, there may have been hairline fractures in the shell that you did not see that let that in. And that's what you'll see first. So if you see that, don't, don't do it. And honestly, this is why I always crack my eggs in a separate bowl. I don't, if don't I'm crack them right into the pan or no, whatever, you, because then you can, with. What if you get something awful and you've ruined everything? So crack it separately to make sure and then add it in later. Um, same thing here. So if you have a, an egg with a darkened yolk, like this, this one has obviously been, he's been sitting too long. He's been hanging out somewhere in a barn and nobody gathered him and he's no good. He probably smells pretty bad too. Don't eat that. Um, Another one here, this one, you can see the membranes down at the bottom are really discolored. And another thing you'll notice when you do crack it, if it's not any good, your yolk will not have any defined edges. It'll just kind of be a blob, a blob of orange slime. So not, it won't be held together in that normal yolk fashion no, or, or and broken it won't, yolk. So there won't be like an egg white and the yolk. It'll just kind of all be the mm, same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Avoid those things. Perfect. Yeah. That's pretty easy. Pretty cut, clear cut and dry. It is. If it doesn't pass your eyes or your nose, don't eat don't it. Don't do it. Uh -uh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here's the cool thing, you guys. Um, we do have the Wyoming Food Freedom Act. So this allows you as backyard producers to be able to sell your extra eggs that you're not going to consume anywhere in this state. So this means that they can be ungraded as long as we follow those USDA regulations. So you don't have to grade your eggs and you can still sell them. So let me tell you some regulations on these because this is important if you're going to sell them. Now, if you're selling them to like your neighbor, that's a little different. But if you're selling them to like the farmer's co-op or the um, like- At a farmer's a, market. At the farmer's market, exactly. These are some things that you do have to do, okay? So they do have to be washed and refrigerated um, your cartons have to be clean and they can be used. Like you can recycle cartons, which is great, but you just have to like, I don't know, I used to Sharpie and just blacked out all the original labeling, like scratch through whatever. All the marketing aspect on it. Right. Um, and then you need to include your name and address of the producer, the date that you got like packaged them. And then you need to say on there that they are ungraded and for them to keep refrigerated. As long as you do those things, you're golden. What do you mean by ungraded? So un when you're grading an egg, that is basically you're judging the external condition of the egg, whether it's uniform shape, color, um, also the weight of the egg. So whether it's a peewee or, or medium, large or extra large, um, should have included some stuff on that. But basically no, it's... Making sure that it's, that they're consistent. Some states do require, um, require people if they're going to sell their eggs, they have to take a class through extension to learn how to grade their eggs. Um, Wyoming's not one of them, but I know you can see in the, um, I, know, I think it was my granddad had, uh, it was like a little scale thing and you put the egg on it and it would tell you the, si the, the size. Which size it met. Yeah, yep. based on the ounces of the egg but we're not required to grade them, but making sure that they are clean for sure is a big one. Clean you, and refrigerated and labeled appropriately. Correct. And you may have people request to have unwashed eggs. Um, and that's something that you can do separately, but you can't, and you can sell them privately, but you can't do that like at your farmer's market. Another thing that I didn't mention with, with the gathering of the eggs, if you are wanting to hatch eggs, if you are wanting to have more chicken babies, um, don't wash them. They need to keep that bloom on there. Um, and so that's an important piece. So I wouldn't refrigerate them and I wouldn't wash them. And 
you can save them for about, after about a week, they start losing fertility. Um, and I also kind of rotate them a little bit on the counters if I'm waiting a week to get enough to hatch in an incubator, just so you don't have any attachments to the inside of the egg with the yolk and things. So just keep them we rotated, just, wait a week. Great. So we just got a question off of Facebook. Oh, yeah. And does eggs sitting out in the light, do they turn white over time? Do they the fade? Shell in the shell itself? Summer? I think so. The color of the shell, I, I'm suspecting. I don't know. No. So the, the color of the shell is really dependent on the breed of chicken. So you can have anything from blue to green to white, to cream to Brown. chocolate and speckled eggs. Um, I've never had, I wouldn't sit them on the counter in direct sunlight because that can increase and cause some temperature fluctuations. Um, but I don't think it would change the color or anything because the color of your yolk is actually determined by the nutrition of the hen. So if she's eating things with a lot of beta carotene, she's gonna have more orange yolks that are very, very vibrant and bright. And if she's eating very, you know, corn-based things, she's gonna have pretty pale yolks. Perfect. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, now this is just open-ended questions. <laughs> the free-for-all time. Live it up. We, we had a flurry of questions. I am not seeing any right now. We've, we've handled them throughout the whole program. Okay. There was one um, that I, let's see. There was a comment on Facebook of, I keep a blender in the coop area. Any compromised eggs gets blended and becomes the feed for those chickens. So it's kind Love of an it. easy process. That's a clever um, idea. Another one, do you ever make manure tea from fresh manure and use it for fertilizer? So I think cleaning out those nest boxes, that manure, um, I, I guess from my perspective, I'll just answer, yeah, uh, chicken manure is very high in nitrogen. Right. And it's a very good source if you're going to be going into composting or, or utilizing and spreading that on the garden for next year. But I wouldn't put it on directly, right, on a growing crop. It's too hot. So it's, yeah, too hot. You're going to burn. So. so I, what we do is we would just, when we'd clean it out, we'd set it off to the side and we'd let it kind of cure for a year. And then we'd spread it out the next spring. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Ryan. My goose eggs are crazy hard to crack. Is that yes. hard for the course or is it a nutritional thing? Nope, it's not nutritional. So like turkey eggs, goose eggs, they do tend to be harder. And that's just because the, the parent animal is larger. And if they're in and out of the nest, you think about if the, that size of an animal incubating, the, the risk of it cracking a thinner shell is higher. So that's just nature being nature. So it's just a thicker shell, more just a thicker shell, shell um, that withstands that weight of the animal. Yeah. And the same thing, um, guinea fowl, their eggs um, almost feel like terracotta. They're a lot harder to crack as well. It's just species specific. But and it's a good thing. I'd rather have a harder shell than a than a soft one. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> I can put a little more force into it if yeah. need be. So uh, that's all I see, Abby. I think awesome. we can wrap it up. The last, we have one comment off of Facebook from a Nancy. Good job, Em. So I'm oh, sure that's, that's a mom. relation. <laughs> <laughs> that's my mom. Thanks, all right. mom. <laughs> well, thank you, Emily. Um, this is great, you guys. You joining us today and yeah. um, lots of questions and interactions. So that's always great. I feel like I got, you know, a little insight for <laughs> my own little backyard flock. So thank you. A lot of fun. Um, anyone who's tuning in or tuned in today, we want to make sure that we get some feedback from all of you. So I know that Jenny will post um, a link for an evaluation to Facebook. And then um, I think when you exit Zoom, then there's an evaluation that pops up. So we really appreciate it if you all can um, just let us know what you think that helps us kind of give direction for future talks and whatnot. And then 
do we need Emily to stop sharing so we can look at the Yeah, we can website? stop sharing. So can <clears throat> there we go. Perfect. Share. So um, also we've got our Barnyards and Backyards website that's here. So these are um, past articles that Jenny's got pulled up here, the treasure trove, and then our Barnyards and Backyards live. So um, today's show will uh, get a little bit of editing and then get posted so people can go back and watch it on YouTube. Um, there's uh, the recording and then the different articles. And then we've still got a few um, episodes still to come throughout the month of April. So I think four more before we kind of go on summer break and everybody get some, you know, enjoy the outdoors. So it looks like oh. next week is taking care of trees. Um, we've got some composting shrubs and some uh, small livestock. There are still the topics to come in April. And then um, just if you've got any questions, you can always stop into your uh, county office. So here's a map of where all of our extension offices are across the state. Stop in, ask questions. Um, you know, happy to get you connected with Emily specifically or different kinds of publications and whatnot. I almost so. forgot something, Abby. Can I interject sure. really quick? I'm so sorry. I had myself a little note here <laughs> to mention um, there are a couple of resources for you guys. Um, there, um, obviously if you're on Facebook, there is a Facebook page called chicken vet corner. And this is one where avian veterinarians can comment and help you. I know a lot of us live in places you can't access. You don't have, um, someone who's really well-versed in caring for birds. So this is a great resource. And we're going to have the link to that Facebook page is going to be where you just were, Abby. And then also, I think she was gonna post it in the comments somewhere. And it didn't come up and I was hoping that it would to remind me. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Chicken Vet Corner. Um, I know that there is some avian influenza going around our country. And in particular with Wyoming, we do have some cases in South Dakota and Nebraska. And so we're here is a site for the USDA gives you some background information about the disease and then also if we can post the um, defend the flock and that's got some great resources of biosecurity and things you can do to protect your birds i'm sorry i didn't mention that earlier but i'm glad i remembered this <laughs> yeah perfect so if anybody's got questions about that check that out yeah and again, just one more reminder to fill out your, or to, uh, yeah, fill out your evaluation and give us some feedback. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. you Abby. It's been a joy today. You guys enjoy yeah. your afternoon. Thanks so much for having me guys.